Hey, it's Tim from TimSteppingOut.com. Today I wanted to talk about where I've kind of gone in terms of um, how I understand early Christianity and why I still don't think Jesus Christ as a, an individual person really existed. Um, I've talked about this on my blog, but I haven't really talked about it on here because I just don't post a lot on here. But I thought that it was worth talking about because I think that my views on Christian history have really kind of progressed since the last time I've talked here. So, um, <clears throat> in a word, what I think happened uh, that gave rise to early Christianity was the Nasserine movement. Um, when you read Epiphanius on the Nasserines, he describes what seems like a Jewish Gnostic group. Uh, he, he, it's kind of funny. He's puzzling over them. He doesn't quite understand what they're all about. But he says that they live amongst the Jews. They practice Jewish customs. But they reject the Pentateuch. They reject the first five books of the Old Testament. And he doesn't quite understand what's going on with them. But when um, I've gotten to understand them, I think Epiphanius is telling the truth here. I, one of the things that I've kind of realized is that Epiphanius was telling the truth more than I thought that he was. You know, like when I first read Epiphanius, I had to put him down because he seemed like a bloviating idiot. But as I read him again, I think that he's probably telling the truth in a lot of details, and I think that he's telling the truth about the Nasserines. The Nasserines claimed, uh, according to Epiphanius, that they had the true writings of Moses. When you look for the profile of people in history uh, who match that description, where that idea could have come from, it kind of gets really obvious. and. I'm, I was a little disappointed to realize that I wasn't the first person to figure this out. <laughs> um, but it was holdovers from the Deuteronomic reform. Uh, you know, so to provide some backstory, um, some maybe 30 years before the first Jewish temple was destroyed, King Josiah... Uh, ordered renovation on Solomon's temple, and his high priest, who was overseeing the um, the renovation, found a long lost book of the law. And in the book, uh, and this is in Second Kings uh, and Second Chronicles, it's in Second Kings twenty two or something like that. But uh, in it, it said it, it implores its readers to reject idols, right? And so what? Um, people realize when they're looking at what this says is that it's major portions of Deuteronomy. In other, and that's why it's called the Deuteronomic Reform, is that it's a major portion of Deuteronomy. It's restating what Moses said. Right? In other words, King Josiah's high priest, uh, at least according to tradition, um, rewrote and added to what Moses was saying. And this, uh, this triggered Josiah to purge out idols and other references, notably to the Queen of Heaven, who was known as Wisdom uh, among the people. Uh, she was the wisdom on earth. She was the counterweight to Moses' law. And the Deuteronomic reform prompted Jewish practitioners to just rely on the law, get rid of the queen of heaven, get rid of the queen's wisdom. Uh, Margaret Barker is, uh, has cracked this code better than anyone. If you want to read more about it, just read um, Margaret Barker. She, just about everything she writes is on this topic, and uh, I think she's cracked it better than anyone. Uh, which is funny because she's a Methodist minister. I, I don't know how you parse this data to the extent that she has and conclude that Jesus was a real person. I, I, it's just silly. But anyway, um, that's not a knock against her. Right? She's brilliant. But um, when you uh, so when you look at what was going on here, um, 
you've got this carryover. I mean, there's obviously going to be holdover, and you see it in Jeremiah 44, uh, where Jeremiah is trying to get people on board after Jews are expelled um, after the Babylonian conquest, and and the temple gets knocked down. And he's saying, come on, get on board. And the women are like, no, we're going to keep burning incense for the queen of heaven. Because look what happened when we stopped. It was a couple decades after uh, the queen got purged out of the temple that, uh, that the temple was destroyed. And so, you know, right away you've got major fodder, right, for this underground movement. And even if there's going to be resistance, even, you know... Um, even if there is physical resistance or um, the threat of, of some sort of danger, if you continue to practice this old version of Judaism, it's still better than the alternative, I think, for a lot of people. Because people are looking at it saying, gosh, we stopped worshiping this queen of heaven and our temple was destroyed. Our holy city was destroyed and everything's worse now. What I think this gave rise to was the Nasserine movement. And the reason that I, I link the two is that if you read um, Revelation 12, uh, you know, you've got this woman who is clothed in the sun, moon at her feet, crown of stars in her hair. Um, this is, I think, obviously a reference to the Queen of Heaven. Uh, and so she's giving, she, she's about to give birth, and she's being tr chased by a dragon. This dragon is trying to kill her and her child. The child is taken up to heaven, and she continues to run away from the dragon. The earth protects her, and the dragon eventually gives up on her and turns his attention to the other children of the woman. And this is in Revelation twelve seventeen. It, it says the other children are the keepers of the law. In Hebrew, nasar is to keep guard or preserve. So I think what, what Revelation 12 is anyway is a carryover from uh, Hebrew traditions. And I think that it's, it's, um, it's quite obviously a shout out to the, Nas the nasar, the Nasareans. Um, there's also Second Esdras 9 through 10, where Ezra is sent to the field. And uh, he, there he encounters a woman with ashes in her head. And she's grieving over the death of her son who died in the bridal chamber. Uh, and so she kind of goes on this lament about what, um, what happened. And then in the field where Ezra was sent... Um, the woman transforms into the city. Right? And so the angel Uriel comes along to explain this to Ezra. And he says, the woman was the queen and she turned into the city and her son was the temple. Her son uh, who died after, you know, whatever age he was, was the temple. So it's very interesting that Jesus is presumed to be about 30 years old because in this translation of years, I think the year, the number 30 comes up, but you have to multiply it by some number of thousand to get to how many years the first temple did not exist. And they're doing, it's kind of weird, but um, it's, it's revealed that this woman is the queen of heaven and her son was the temple. And so... And, she, and, and she's in the field, right? There's all kinds of references to the field. Simon of Cyrene in Mark, uh, in Mark um, 15 is in the field. And he is plucked from the field to bear Jesus' cross. Well, it's no coincidence that Mark's readers believed Simon of Cyrene inherited the Christ. He was in the field. He was he was. Um, planting seeds for the new Jerusalem. This is just a, a metaphor, you know? And so when you look at Revelation, I think it's Revelation 21, they're talking about the new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem would be in the field, and you plant seeds in the field. And that is why, um, you know, that's why there's so many references to the field. That's why the Montanists, 
uh, of uh, whom um, Tertullian belonged, he uh, they 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 believed that too that that we need to build a new Jerusalem. And for the Montanists, it was in central Turkey, just south of Bithynia, just south of Galatia, where um, uh, you you know where Paul was writing. And where all kinds of other stuff in early Christian history was going on. That was where the new Jerusalem would be. And they would plant seeds, which is to say proselytize to would-be Christians, to create a new Jerusalem. And so when you look at what the, um, what the sun was, the sun was the temple, the spirit of the temple. Uh, well, isn't it interesting then that the Apostle Paul is saying, don't you know that you are the temple? <laughs> right? It all, it all starts to make sense. The queen is the spirit, the feminine spirit, and the uh, Christ is the masculine spirit. And wouldn't you know it, <laughs> there's a leader who's talking about this very thing. It's Elkisai, who is described by Epiphanius and Hippolytus. He's leading a group of Ebionites, of um, Essenes, of Nazarenes, who are basically Orthodox Christians, and Nazarenes, who are the Nassar, right? And what does Elkisai believe? He believes that there is a feminine spirit, and a masculine spirit, 96 miles tall in the sky. Right? Well, what's, what is that all about? Well, look at what the Ebionites believed. And the Serinthians, as it turned out. And by the way, Serinthus was claimed, and, and the more I look at it, the more I believe it, to have written Revelation. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the Ebionites and the Serinthians, and evidently the Carpocratians as well, believe that the Christ descended onto Jesus. This man, he received the spirit. He wasn't born of a virgin, right? That was something that the paraclete would have in the Gospel of Thomas. That's why Paul is going around saying he was born from a miscarriage, from a neck trauma in, um, uh, I think it's 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, it's because uh, the spirit descends on you. You are the temple, like, right? Like you can exist without a physical temple because the spirit of the temple exists and it will descend upon you upon proper initiation. Uh, notably that you've been baptized and notably that you're willing to die, right? In Mark 3, they're saying um, Jesus' family thinks he's nuts, well, why would he be nuts if he was born from a virgin? Obviously, Mark's author didn't believe he was born from a virgin. That's nonsense. And of course, everybody and their brother recognizes this. Even, even in like uh, modern scholarship today, they, they recognize that the virgin birth came later. Um, so what I think, uh, what I think is, is happening is that the the Christ, the anointed one, and by the way, Margaret Barker says the anointed, um, I think she says this, comes from the, uh, the, uh, the tree of life, right? So she contrasts the tree of wisdom and the tree of, of life from, the, uh, from Genesis. And she says that the Asherah idol that was in the temple is uh, is representative of the Queen of Heaven, and there was anointing oil from it, and so that you that's why you are the Christ, you are the Anointed One, if you've received anointing oil. So um, that that's what I think is going on: is that the earliest Christians were consuming Revelation in this manner uh, because they were the Nassar, and therefore Serinthus was. Uh, a Nasserene, the Ebionites were Nasserenes, the Essenes were Nasserenes, um, and it, it just kind of evolved from here, and you know, you get the split from the, the Mandeans, and um, uh, I, th I, think, I think the Manichaeans were sort of in this, in this um, group as well, I mean, I think that they kind of evolved from this a little bit later, because Manny was said to be an Elkasite. <laughs> he was from an Elkasite community, and I think that that, uh, even though the Elkasites uh, kind of preceded 
um, this time frame, I think that that's what they were referring to, is that they were a subsequent follower of this Elkisai who led uh, all these Nassar um, believing that there were masculine and feminine spirits in the sky. So that's, that's where I am right now. That's what I think was going on. And that's, I think, explains all these things about what Christianity became over the next couple of years. Why there is Sophia. Sophia is wisdom. Wisdom comes from the Queen of Heaven. It's just that it's the Queen of Heaven in a different society, in the Greek and the Alexandrian society, so, and the Syrian as well. So, anyway, thanks for watching. Bye.